as I was waiting, a word came before my mind. Order of Melchizedek. You know, the subject of Melchizedek is a very, very mysterious subject. The one word, order of Melchizedek, it just came flushing on the, the mind of my, on my mind, you know. So I was, I wondered, what is the order of Melchizedek? So I began to meditate on that. Order of Melchizedek, order of Melchizedek. As I began to meditate, I was aware of something. What I was aware was, my heart was now pairing with heaven. I could feel that, you know, I could feel that I was getting into the frequency of heaven concerning this subject. The more I meditated, the more I thought in it, my heart began to open. My spirit began to open and it was now pairing with heaven. As soon as the connection was established, connected. You see that on your device, connected. <laughs> Revelations began to flow into my heart about the Melchizedek. What is the order of Melchizedek? Why the Melchizedek order is very, very important for these last days? What is the calling of the Melchizedek anointing? Who is Melchizedek? Before you can know about the order, you must know who is Melchizedek. And how does that apply to this last day's prophetic generation? And what is the original origin of Melchizedek? Where did, where did it all started? So these revelations began to flow into me. So I quickly began to write down everything that the Lord showed me. When I finished writing, it was four in the morning. Now, concerning the subject of Melchizedek, there are three books in the Bible that talks about this subject of Melchizedek. In Genesis, we are introduced to Melchizedek. In Psalms, we are shown of the future of Melchizedek. And then in Hebrews, the Apostle Paul details the past, the present, and the future of Melchizedek. But then as he was writing, you will read in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, like this. Called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say, and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. You know, when I came to the last part of this sentence years ago, I was very saddened. The Apostle Paul was given a full revelation about who Melchizedek was, is, and is to come. But he could not teach it to the then audience because they were dull of understanding. They were still very baby Christian. They have not progressed beyond babyhood Christian. You know what is babyhood Christian? I give you this simple test. By this simple test, you can know whether you are baby Christian or you are toddler Christian or you are primary school or secondary school or JC, poly or uni. <laughs> which level you are. If for every small thing you ask other people to pray, you are baby Christian. <laughs> if for every small thing you go and line up and ask people to prophesy over you, you are baby Christian. See, when you are baby, a baby drinks milk from the mother. Even the, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Even bottle feeding, the mother have to hold the bottle. The baby can't hold the bottle. And then from baby becomes toddler. Still cannot drink, uh, eat normal food. I remember my little nephew, when he started to crawl, he can, 
he was still drinking milk, but now he could hold the bottle by himself, but still drinking milk. It's a little progress. Instead of the mother holding, or the in his case was the grandmother holding, he was now holding it himself. But then he grows a little, grows a little, still can eat now no more milk, still better food, but not still wholesome food like what the adults eat. But so these are progressive stages. But if you have grown to where you are after years of being a Christian, if you are still like, you know, headache called Pastor Stephen, please pray for me or our elder. Pray for me. Every small thing you ask other people to pray for you, you are baby. This was the problem with the Apostle Paul's audience. They were all baby. So how to teach them deep things? They, they were dull of understanding. Now the other thing is, besides being baby, they were dull of understanding, which means they, their hearts were not open to deeper things of God. Now, because of that, he just held back everything. Which many wonderful ministers of God do today too. They held back. Maturity level of the audience, or the believers, is also very important to draw on the anointing. So when you draw on the anointing, see like, not only I must be paired, you also must be paired. <laughs> Connected. Then, the flow, the download can come out fast. If not, you'll have slow network. <laughs> download very slow, and then every now and then, it'll be buffering. <laughs> Which means, every now and then, I have to pause and make you laugh a little bit. <laughs> now, even the Lord Jesus had this problem. If you read in John chapter 16, verse 12, he says, I have many things to share to you, but you are not ready now. So he himself had this problem. So he took help back. If not, he would have shared many more things. The things that the Lord held back were the things that the apostle Paul shared in the church. Now, if you continue to read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. For it says here, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, if you look at verse 13 and verse 14, it classifies two groups of Christians, babies and matured. You can mature from babyhood to adulthood only by, by what? Verse 14 gives us the answer. By exercising your spiritual senses. You know, we don't exercise our spiritual senses. Just let, let, let me give you one very everyday example. In the early 70s, when telephones were first introduced, it's the rotary kind, not even the push button one, rotary. So the rotary, or even later on was the push button, everybody memorizes everybody's phone number. You memorize, there were six digits or seven digits, you memorize 10, 15 numbers, you memorize every, every number. Those who are dull of understanding, they write it down on a small notebook. <laughs> Have you been there? Yes. Right, okay. So, you write down everything. So, you remember. By remembering, you're exercising your memory power. The memory works better. And also, when you go to school, 
you do mathematics you do addition subtraction division all by memory because there's no calculator then a few years pass by and then came calculators when you when you get calculators you no more exercise your brain because now you have calculator you just type you just punch in 1 plus 1 even 1 plus 1 you use a calculator <laughs> That's how sadly we have become, you know. Then years goes by. Now you then came cellular phone, mo mobile phones. So the olden days, the first generation mobile phones, still people memorize all the numbers. But today you have smartphones. Phones become smarter, people become stupider. <laughs> Now nobody remembers any number. Am I right, everybody? It's all the smartphone remembers for you. See, that's why it's called smartphone, because we are no more smart. So now we are all prisoners of technology. Now, we don't exercise our spiritual senses. If you continue to be babies, if you continue to rely on others, how are you going to exercise your senses? If you con, if you always rely on your pastor or your elders or your spiritual leaders uh, to seek a word from the Lord, to seek the will of God, how are you going to exercise your senses? Some years ago, I think this was about twenty, more than twenty years ago, we had a partner in Singapore. This lady works for AIA Insurance. And she's a high flyer in the insurance. And she called me one afternoon with great urgency. Please pray for me right now. I need to go and make a very important deal. I'm meeting this Indonesian customer, and if I close this deal, the commissions itself will be a few hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I need to know the will of God. And she was driving and talking to me at the same time. And she said, "Please, can you please pray?" So I told her, "Sister." Don't rush. Don't rush. You just wait and pray. She said, "No, I got no time. I'm driving right now." So I said, "No, you know, a very important decision like this. Don't rush. Just wait and pray." She said, "No," and she kept on, you know, pushing the responsibility on me, which I'm not uh, uh, averse to that. And then. When she keep on insisting, you know how important it is to know the will of God, and how she has no time to wait. And when she was blowing it all up, so finally I told her, since you have no time to wait on God, why bother to pray, or why bother to seek the will of God? The moment I said that, she jumped on the brakes. So that arrested her attention. So then she asked me, what what do you suggest I do? I said, cancel your meeting. Cancel your meeting. Go home. Have a good dinner with your family. After your husband and your children have all gone to sleep, you come to the living room. You kneel down and you pray. Put the matter before the Lord. Tell him the good and the bad, the pros and the cons of this deal. Tell him everything, and then. You just wait on the Lord quietly, and the Lord will speak to you. How will He speak, ah? Huh? <laughs> so that's how she asked me. So I said either through visions, through dreams, or He'll put an impression in you. A impression will be put on your thoughts, showing you what the will of God is. Next morning, you call me, and I will confirm to you what you have heard, whether right or wrong. So, she was so happy. Seven thirty in the morning, she called me. She called me, and she was so excited that God spoke to her that night, and told her what the will of God was concerning that business deal. I said, "You are one hundred percent correct." She asked me, "How do you know?" Yesterday afternoon, when you were talking to me on the phone, the Lord already told me what the will was. 
Aya. Why didn't you tell me then? So I told her, if I had told you then, you would not have exercised your senses. You would not have learned how to wait on God. You would not have learned how to listen to God to know His will. See, this is the job of every pastor, teacher, to teach the people how to mature and grow. That is the very purpose of the fivefold ministry, for the perfection of the saints, to bring everybody to the maturity. So you should grow. Only the matured sons will enter into the promised land, not those who will be babies.